uh, the title is, uh, I changed the title a little bit because it's actually a decade plus of discovery, observing the changing moon with the lunar reconnaissance orbiter. Um, you know, one of the main reasons we study the moon is because it provides a, uh, a record of uh, the Earth moon system through time uh, since, uh, since the formation of the Earth moon system. Uh, and you know through impacts and so uh, much has been preserved but at the same time you're also studying processes of course and, and, and these are things that have happened over billions of years so the moon is changing even now it's uh, changing slowly um, but with a mission like LRO that's been in, on the moon we're in our uh, will be 12 years uh, in June, and uh, LRO is able to now even see changes on the moon. So the moon is still always changing, and, and we're able to make, make those observations. But uh, I want to kind of start at the beginning of where, where how LRO happened. Um, Okay, so it actually uh, began around 2004 when the president announced a new vision for space exploration that included among its goals to return to the moon by 2020 uh, as a launching point for missions beyond. So uh, we will send a series of robotic missions to the moon so that the space search will prepare for future human exploration. And, you know, that's a broad goal, uh, but what, what does that mean, uh, you know, for folks that, who have to act on, on those, that, those broad goals? What does it mean to go back to the moon? Well, at the time, you know, we, we actually, uh, even though we had the Apollo and, and uh, era missions to the moon, um, Apollo and the uh, Soviet missions to the moon that we still had broadly a lot of uh, a lot of gaps in our knowledge and the terrain was unknown broadly um, the radiation environment the challenge of of going to the moon and staying there for periods long periods of time while well, you have 14 day nights where the temperatures get down to 100 Kelvin. Uh, it is a long way from, from Earth uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, if something goes wrong, you can't immediately uh, mount a rescue mission the way you might be able to for, you know, near Earth, the space station. And you have to consider uh, what resources might be on the moon, you know, whether there is water and uh, shelter, uh, energy. So that led to the LRO mission. Why LRO? Well, we had the vision. This is kind of a repeat of what I've, I've said. Um, the mission was directed to Goddard Space Flight Center, where I am, um, following a science definition team report. Then LRO was, um, you know, began as an exploration mission, so it was led by the Exploration Systems Mission Directorates at NASA, uh, not the Science Mission Directorate, but it was really kind of a partnership. And the instruments that were selected for LRO were really um, all, all science instruments. Um, many of them were uh, copies of instruments that have flown to, to Mars, um, for example. And we, we go with the philosophy that, you know, exploration is enabled by science and science is enabled by exploration. And so we, don't, we see this things as working hand in hand. Uh, so we, we were given a, a list of LRO exploration objectives. We wanted safe landing sites, which meant high resolution imagery. Uh, 
Uh, we wanted to locate potential resources uh, and uh, understand the space environment, energetic particles. Uh, we wanted some new technology, although most of the instruments had a lot of heritage. This is an image uh, from Apollo 15, and you see that uh, the lander ended up at a tilt, which I think is like eight degrees, as I recall. And um, it's something that, you know, if we go back to the moon, we want to avoid. So with the maps that LRO is creating uh, and the technology advances we have, we, we think that, uh, you know, we, we can greatly reduce the risk of a return mission. So here are the instruments. Um, going over them, we have a, the crater, which is a cosmic ray telescope. Um, it's led by Harlan Spence at the University of New Hampshire. The Diviner Lunar Radiometer um, from UCLA, and David Page is the uh, PI on that. LAMP, the Lyman Alpha Mapping Project, which is a imaging UV imaging spectrometer. It's led by Kurt Rutherford out of Swery, LEND, uh, the Lunar Exploration Neutron de uh, Detector, which is led by Igor Mitrofanov uh, from IKI. It is the only uh, foreign contributed instrument on LRO. LOLA is a lunar orbital laser altimeter. Uh, David Smith from uh, MIT, he was at Goddard when, when we began the mission. A mini RF was a uh, synthetic aperture rad radar. And um, it was a tech demo, but uh, it's still operating. Uh, without its transmitter, we're doing bi-static radar uh, using transmitters on, on the Earth, but and it's providing uh, good data. And then we have the, the camera system. Um, oh, yeah, a mini RF is from APL. Um, Wes Patterson's the PI. LROC, uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Camera. We have a wide angle camera, which uh, has uh, filters, uh, seven band UV visible filters, and uh, the narrow angle cameras, which uh, from 50 kilometers gave us a uh, resolution of, of a half a pixel resolution of half, half a meter, 50 centimeters. And this is the same set of uh, instruments uh, showing showing some of the data products. So uh, Lola gives us the topography, the two cameras um, give us, of course, the imagery. Uh, the Lyman Alpha Mapping Project is an imaging spectrometer, so it gives us uh, images and UV. Diviner gives us um, the temperature of the moon and and derived products, for example, uh, volatile stabili stability, regular structure, um, mini RF crater, um, concentrates on the radiation environment, but also radiation that's reflected back from the moon. Uh, we, we're, we're observing, um, you know, composition effects from the cosmic rays. Uh, LEND, the neutrons, we're interested in the epithermal neutrons, which is a signature of, of concentrations of hydrogen and of poles. We, we um, postulate that those are uh, in the form of water. Um, not mentioned before, uh, really not so much a science experiment, but we do laser ranging from, from the Earth to LRO. Um, so this is this is just showing uh, kind of what where where we were when we started our knowledge of the of the moon the surface of the moon you know the topography and you can see it's a dramatic improvement even after just a few years uh, uh, well really just one year we had improved the topography and our knowledge of the shape of the moon dramatically. Um, Prior to this, um, it was uh, Clementine, the uh, previous mission, which was very short and wasn't able to, 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 to get great measurements. 
So when we did the, when we launched LRO, I mean, we actually knew the shape of Mars better than the moon. So um, I want to say something about the LRO orbit history. So we started the mission off. Uh, uh, the top the top graph is is the uh, periapsis apoapsis of the spacecraft um, through time, and so we started the spacecraft after uh, commissioning. We went into the observing orbit, which was a 50 kilometer orbit, approximately, and we were able to stay that in that orbit about two years. Uh, we had to do weekly, or I'm sorry, monthly uh, station keeping, uh, which used up a lot of propellant. And so we, in the end, had to uh, move out of that, that orbit uh, into this frozen orbit. And you see toward the end there, there's some dips down to low, low um, periapsis. Uh, and we did those in order to get uh, some extra high resolution imagery of the Apollo landing sites and other uh, sites of interest. But then we were eventually into the frozen orbit, uh, which is one that uh, doesn't require uh, station keeping. We did a few burns uh, through time to uh, keep us in, in a sort of a stable, relatively stable periapsis orbit. Um, um, but now we're we're just letting the spacecraft drift, and this this pattern will repeat and eventually come back to the original. Um, uh, but we're in an orbit that uh, is is what we call a frozen orbit. We should last. Um, I mean, the the spacecraft should stay in orbit, you know, long after the mission ends. Uh, at the same time, this, the spacecraft. You know, we started off with a with a polar orbit, uh, with, with spacecraft going right over the poles. But with time, the inclination of that orbit has has uh, degraded. So we're losing about uh, uh, half a degree uh, per year. And the consequence of that is, is shown here. So um, this is this is what the orbit uh, looking down on the South Pole. What it looks like. Uh, you know, over a 14-day period, and uh, you see, you see, we get lots of crossovers around the around the poles, and so, uh, you know, if we're interested in in whether or not there's water in the pole at the, at the South Pole, and then of course at the, the North Pole, you know, this is this is an ideal orbit. Uh, but we were in this orbit for a couple of years, and you know, we pretty much saturated our observations in that area. But with time, as we're drifting away, this is this is what it uh, begins to look like, um, and this is close to to the present time. And you see, this hole has grown in to to our coverage. Uh, but at the same time, you see that you know through you, you see a lot of repeat uh, coverage over the rims of this this sort of pinwheel kind of. Uh, um, pattern um, and we are uh, about to propose a three-year extended mission for LRO and so this is uh, what our coverage will look like over those you know from now until until then and you see we get um, we definitely get a lot more coverage in areas such that we actually rival the amount of coverage we had at, at, at near the near the poles maybe not directly over the, the south pole but very near the poles and it's important here because uh some of these what these these lines here are um uh, illustrating some of the permanently shadowed craters so the craters in which the sun doesn't get high enough in the sky and so they they never see sunlight directly and so uh these areas, like this is a Cabeus crater here, which is um, one of the coldest spots on the moon and where we have observations of um, indications that there's, there's lots of significant water in those areas. So, you know, getting 
getting lots of coverage there. This late in the mission is, is certainly an advantage. Uh, okay, so the theme of this talk, I'm trying to make it sort of uh, observing the, tra the, the, the changing moon, and I'm gonna go from early to late. Uh, so it's kind of the earliest is, you know, as the mission goes on and we repeat uh, observations over the same areas under the same lighting conditions, we can see the changing moon. We, we see new impacts. And um, uh, we've discovered hundreds of these and we've uh, come up with an automated procedure for looking for them. So we randomly or more or less randomly uh, do repeat coverage over certain areas. And uh, we have an algorithm that takes the ratio of the before and after. So this would be the, the before on the far right, I think, and uh, the after on the left. And if you were given these things you, and you search with your eye, you might pick up that, that uh, new impact. You can see the change. But you know, where you're looking at hundreds and hundreds of these, it's not so easy. Um, but by ratioing the two uh, and using a computer algorithm for looking for that, these kinds of changes, um, we can, we can uh, sort of automate the process of finding these new impacts. And uh, the computer spits out things to look at, and then a human can come and uh, identify them and confirm that they, in fact, are new impacts. Also, we're seeing on the moon um, disturbances uh, also associated with uh, impacts, but they, they seem to be secondary effects. And um, so almost every image that we take, repeat image, after a couple of years, we see significant uh, very minor changes, splotches we're calling them. And there's some kind of secondary uh, process that is disturbing the regolith and, and, and enough that it shows up in the photometry, such that uh, even over a few hundred years, we think the whole, the whole moon will, will experience this kind of really slight changes, not so much um, just disturbances of the of the very top layer of the of the surface of the moon. One of the things we're observed over the over the 12 years is the solar cycle. And uh, so we began the mission the with the uh, crater instrument, uh, the Cosmic Ray Telescope. And uh, what you're, you're seeing here, the spikes are solar energetic particle events, and the, the, the drifting low level is uh, cosmic rays. Um, and so at the beginning of the mission, we had an uh, inactive sun, and uh, the folks at the crater team were beginning to worry that they were never going to see a solar energetic particle event. <laughs> but of course, uh, the solar weather does change and uh, uh, the sun became active. We started seeing lots of these, lots of these events. You see that the cosmic rays uh, are somewhat suppressed due to the activity of the sun and the increased magnetic field. And then uh, through time, those uh, events started to peter out and we were back we're kind of now back on, on the inactive sun this is an example of the apollo landing site this is apollo 17. Uh, you can really see in de the details of uh, what uh, uh, the, the activity of the astronauts there the, the paths that they follow the footpaths um, you see some kind of brightening around the, uh, the landing site, which is, uh, again, due to disturbances of the regolith, changing the photometric properties of the surface. 
So we, with the uh, narrow angle camera, uh, you know, we don't have a stereo camera on, on LRO, but with the narrow angle camera, we can take um, uh, stereo images by just um, on one orbit, take an image uh, on the next orbit where we've moved a little bit or, this, or the moon has actually moved beneath us. Uh, we take the same image and get that stereo effect. And that allows us to create a digital elevation map at high resolution. And this is this is an example, uh, again, of the, the Apollo, uh, Apollo 11 landing site, uh, where we've had that stereo imagery. And here you can see, looking from above, you can see West Crater, in which uh, They were about to land, and they had to pilot uh, the, the, the lander over to the eventual landing site. And so you kind of see the trace of that, that path there. This is West Crater. Um, so uh, Neil Armstrong, of course, was the person piloting. And here they walked over to West Crater to see what, uh, what it was that they were avoiding. and. Uh, Here's LRO uh, image from above, and you see that tremendous boulder crater, uh, boulders uh, in the crater. So um, uh, one of the aspects of, you know, one of the requirements of LRO is finding safe landing sites. It's actually not hard to find safe landing sites. It's really uh, what you want to do is find the sites to avoid. Well, West Crater is obviously something you don't want to land in. So um, going back in time now from, from the present to uh, maybe a few hundred million years, um, the diviner instrument measures the uh, temperature of the, of the moon. And in particular, it measures how the temperature changes when uh, sunset comes. And one of its data products is, uh, is rock abundances. So um, uh, you derive the rock abundance by just observing how quickly the, t the temperature is changing. And uh, the rocks tend to remain hot. And uh, so if you have a place like West Crater, uh, it will show up as a, as a, heat, a hotter, hot anomaly, I guess you might say. Um, and it, that's again related to the boulders there, but it turns out if the if the and, and craters with lots of boulders are young craters because uh, old old craters uh, the solar wind uh, over time and micrometeorites have ground down those boulders. Uh, so so you can see in with the rock abundance relatively young craters, but very young craters actually show up as cold spots. So this was a discovery by RO and the diviner team that um, that instead of 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 the regolith staying warm as night uh, came, it actually stayed cooler and. Apparently, it seems that, that when you have an impact, um, it actually fluffs up the regolith a bit, uh, leading to more insulation and the top surface then, uh, because it's no longer connected uh, to, the, um, uh, to the interior as, as strongly and it's more insulated from it, it, it cools down faster. And so, we, they're calling these cold spots. And, and I say it's from the present to the, um, you know, maybe 100 million years or so, um, because some of these new impacts show, in fact, that they have these uh, cold spot um, in, uh, as a result of, of, of the new impact. Um, one of the uh, science results is the uh, potential that uh, evidence that volcanism on the moon um, ended more 
recently then had thought. So volcanism on the moon was thought to have ended, um, you know, on the order of a billion years ago. But there's evidence that that uh, from these images of uh, what scientists are calling the regular Mari patches. Uh, this is a, this is an image of Ina D, uh, which is a um, volcanic caldera. Um, based on the craters, crater counting, and also the um, sharpness of of the changes of the edges, it's an indication that uh, these features aren't very old. So based on the crater counting and the uh, um, sharpness of the edges, you know, they haven't been ground down by micrometeorites. Um, you, you derive a, a, a young age for these on the order of you know, 50 million years. Uh, that's a, this is a controversial result. Uh, uh, other scientists don't agree with it. They don't really believe that. Uh, this is possible. So there's some controversy and uh, it hasn't been resolved. I think we need a, a mission to collect samples and show the real age. Uh, another uh, finding from LRO is, is the extensive uh, number of lobate scarfs. So here you have, it's a, it's a compressional feature, tectonic feature where the um, uh, where you're you're forming these 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 scarps, and they're all over uh, distributed all over the moon. We've th found many thousands of them, um, and it's uh, an indication that the moon is simply still shrinking. And again, we know that these these uh, features are fairly young, you know, and hundreds hundred million years um, because of um, uh, because of crater counting techniques and and uh, um, the fact that their you know their their height is not extremely high and they haven't been ground down with time, you know if they were a billion years old they they would have been erased. So I'll talk about some destinations. You know uh, we're going to go back to the moon. Well, the most likely place uh, or not necessarily the most likely, but the, one of the most sought after places are the poles. And the reason again is because potential for water in the poles. Um, this is this is a uh, diviner map. These are the maximum temperatures, uh, seasonal temperatures of here the Summer and winter on uh, it was summer. Summer on the South Pole. I guess it was winter on the. Uh, no, it's, they're both South Pole. Sorry, summer and winter on the South Pole, um, and and it's important. You're interested in the maximum temperatures, and the minimum temperatures are in these permanently shadowed areas are as low as 30 Kelvin. Extremely cold, cold enough to trap volatiles for uh, geological periods of time. Volatiles meaning Water, of course, among other things. Uh, this is a result from the LEND instrument, also on the South Pole. You see that uh, uh, they, these are these are hydrogen maps uh, in sort of weight percent equivalent water, and you see in these permanently shadowed areas, you know, the the, the heavy concentration. This is Cavius Crater, which is kind of the darkest area. Um, that has been observed. Uh, again, these are these are places where uh, potentially uh, future missions to the moon could go and um, and mine for water and other volatiles. But going to the, these permanently shadowed areas, well, uh, that's tough. But uh, but there are also areas in which, uh, because of the inclination of the moon, is some of these areas are, are lit most of the time. Um, here, here's just an image of showing the um, stability uh, of, of 
various volatiles as a function of temperature. Uh, below here is, is, is the uh, area in kilometers squared um, that see these maximum uh, temperatures. Uh, so, so those areas below 40 Kelvin, they exist, but it's only a small amount where that, that maximum is, like Cavius Crater, for example. Um, but you see that water is, is stable, uh, you know, below 100, 150 Kelvin, or I'm sorry, that's below 115, I guess it looks like 100, 110 Kelvin, I would say. Sorry, it's late for me. <laughs> um, and um, other volatiles that that should, should exist. And we know with the L-Cross experiment, um, so L-Cross was an experiment that dropped the uh, um, upper stage of the launch vehicle uh, into a crater and followed it in. Uh, L-Cross also launched with LRO, so it was very much a coordinated experiment. Um, that many of these compounds are there. They were observed. And in fact, this is this is an image of the LAMP instrument. Um, it's not really, it's an image of the data of the LAMP instrument as a function of time projected. So this is the slit. It's projected on what the lamp, what lamp was observing when we saw this bright spot. So LRO was going, going in orbit to observe the L-cross impact. And we turned the LAMP instrument to observe it. So here again is, is the LAMP instrument response as a function of time. Um, and suddenly the plume goes by the instrument or the, the spacecraft goes by the impact put, and, and you see this increase in counts. And it's an imaging spectrometer. And so uh, from their data, they were able to uh, distinguish uh, these volatile elements, magnesium, calcium, lots of mercury, H2CO. Um, we are, we, the instrument was, is not, it did, not the right wavelengths for detecting water, but the L-Cross instrument, instruments on the L-Cross spacecraft, which followed the uh, upper stage into the uh, crater, uh, did, observe, did observe water. Um, so, okay, this is, this is a, from the LROC instrument. It looks like an image, but it's, it's, it's not. What it is is a histogram. So when we go over the, the poles, um, we take images, and if a pixel has a bright spot in it, uh, it, it, it adds to, that, to this image. Um, and so what you're seeing is a histogram showing as a function of location on, on the South Pole of um, light through a full year of observation. Um, and you see the brightest spots are, are spots that are um, almost always illuminated. So this is a Shackleton crater, which is right at the South Pole. And, um, it, it, it is a potential destination because it, if you land there, you have access to su sunlight most of the time, and then you're close to these permanently shadowed areas in which you might be able to uh, uh, find resources. So this is, again, uh, showing this, this part, this edge of the crater. And... Uh, that edge is illuminated 94% of the year. The longest time in, out of sunlight is 43 hours. It does get incredibly cold in these cold traps, 
but in the sunlight, it's actually not too bad. Two hundred twenty K, something that uh, you know we have the, the technology and the understanding of how to uh, uh, how to how to survive there. Destinations, perhaps uh, lunar pets. So. It was actually the Japanese Salonay spacecraft that first saw the lunar pits, discovered them. But with the uh, high resolution camera on LRO, we were able to really uh, uh, say something about more about what these, these pits are. And, and we've discovered since the original discovery of these larger ones, uh, around 200 of them on the moon. And, and, you know, they're thought to be a volcanic uh, um, features uh, where they may be tunnels, and these are collapsed tunnels. Here's uh, evidence, you know, we, we turn the spacecraft off to the side to, to, to derive evidence that, in fact, the pits um, you know, they're not just straight down. There does appear to be, you know, something underneath. So wouldn't it be great to uh, send astronauts there or some kind of a rover that could explore these, these things, potential lunar bases. And then, of course, uh, there's a lot of interest in, in South Pole, Aiken Basin. Uh, one of the largest basins in the solar system, and um, uh, an impact that took place early and relatively early in the moon's history. Um, but there's a lot of interest in getting samples from South Pole Aiken um, because, it, of course, it, it impacts do the job of drilling for you, right? So. This would be kind of the deepest into the moon that we could get without uh, extreme drilling measures. Uh, and here is the, the same data in, in topography from, a, from the Alola instrument. So LRO has, after, after uh, two years, um, under the Exploration Systems Mission Directorate. We transitioned uh, into the Science Mission Directorate. And we've been a science, uh, science mission uh, since then. Um, but it's turned around a bit. Uh, we, you know, with the, the emphasis on the moon again, with the Artemis project and NASA going back to the moon and of course other agencies are going back to the moon. We're starting to get lots of requests for, for uh, uh, more, uh, more information. So this is, this is an example where we, we had received uh, some uh, requests for, for looking at specific landing sites for ISRO, uh, for Chandrayaan-2. Uh, this was, in the end, not one of the, not the not the landing site that was selected, but uh, uh, it demonstrates you know what we're capable of. And so here's a here's a to topographic map uh, of a uh, a ridge potential landing site on, on the moon on the South Pole, and. Um, we also derived kind of slope maps from the topography. And so with the blue, you see relatively, you can see that it's relatively flat um, and a potential landing site. Uh, this is actually fairly old. We've received actually more requests. I, I, I wasn't able to update this, this chart, but this is, a, a, you know, examples of requests we've gotten from ESA, ISRO, JAXA, Los Cosmos, and then the Lunar X Prize. Um, since then, uh, we've had the CLIPS missions, 
Uh, these are commercial lunar uh, program that NASA has. Uh, where NASA is really attempting to uh, um, embrace the, a new model for uh, space exploration. Uh, so we're uh, we're encouraging commercial programs for exploring the moon and uh, um, so many many of these X prize uh, participants have become businesses uh, to uh, uh, have NASA as a customer for taking for taking uh, instrumentation to the moon and so we received uh, requests from them uh, on landing sites. So uh, that's sort of the end of, uh, of, of the talk. Um, LRO has been a, a really productive mission in terms of, of science. And I, I had, a lot, had a lot to choose from about what I could talk about. But I, I just sort of kind of selected a few things. Um, uh, again, try to stick with the theme of the time element. We're with a long mission. We are able to, uh, and it's pretty exciting to see changes on the moon. You know, you think of it as being eternal, and uh, of course, it's it's billions of years old, uh, but it's changing, and and we're observing it. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, here are some of the special issues uh, that. Um, uh, we, we published uh, and continue to do so. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, John. Uh, this is a very nice presentation and a detailed description of the LRO mission with uh, excellent results over the last decade or so. Um, I think do you, anyone has questions uh, to, to Dr. Keller? And, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask the questions. Um, or raise your hand. The I, I have a question, a couple of questions uh, now, because you, you saw some of the uh, uh, images showing the um, the new you know new craters created by by recent impact right on the yes. on the moon. Um, those uh, some of them might have been already seen also from 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 the Earth. You know those are in, uh, we call it lunar impact flashes. Uh, yes, that, that's correct. Um, the um, the first impact that we observed, new impact we observed, was observed from from Earth first, and um, uh, it was pretty exciting at the time. We it was uh, uh, and and I believe at this point we have three impacts that were observed from from Earth. Um, and we were given the coordinates, and then we went off and searched for them and found them. It's really only possible because we have imaged those areas before. It's really uh, not possible to say just from looking at an image that it's a new impact because a fresh crater is fresh for, for a very long time. With the before and after, then it's very clear. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah. Um, we I think we have one measurement from from an observatory in Spain, where in fact I think that's the largest impact. So of course the impacts seen on Earth are are the larger ones. I believe that was like a seventy meter crater. Because you you have a, such a good uh, image uh, that the, has such a high resolution. So I remember that um, there was a discussion uh, maybe a, a, a almost ten years ago about trying to to study the um, the uh, the asymmetry. I mean, the 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 leading side and and turning side of the, of the moon on this uh, small new craters, uh, because the, the the idea is that the the moon is uh, orbiting around the Earth, uh, and then the 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 meteoroids are hitting the uh, the moon uh, kind of isotropically, but adding the the orbital velocity uh, direction of the moon usually creates certain asymmetry. Uh, from the from the symmetry, you could tell that the, even to tell you that the kind of orbital velocity distribution of the small bodies in the solar system. Um, and uh, one study by I think by by uh, by 
Takahashi Ito and, and Renu Mahotra in Arizona, uh, somehow they claim that the, uh, the theoretically derived uh, asymmetry is different from, um, from the observations at that time. Yeah. So they were saying that maybe, you know, if you're giving me a better resolution uh, uh, data, I could uh, resolve the, you know, the, the, the problem. And have you, have you tried looking into that? Uh, anyone of the RRO team looking into that problem? Well, I'm, I'm aware that um, uh, the measurements of, of dust impacts, so it's, it's, it wasn't uh, the LRO mission, it was, uh, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank, uh, a, a recent mission, uh, LADI, uh -huh. um, which had a, a, a dust measurement device on it. And, um, the dust it was measuring really was from impacts, mm -hmm. and they did see an asymmetry in, in the in the measurements. Um, I don't know that anyone has observed uh, just by looking at at um, recent impacts uh, an asymmetry. That's not to say it's not there. I don't know if anyone's really looked at it. One thing about the impacts um, with uh, you know, that observed by LRO. In the end, it's not that many, and so the statistics aren't necessarily high enough to, mm. to bring that out, I suspect. Well, since you're, you're, you'll be operating for the next, ten, uh, next three years at least, um, yeah. there will be a number of, of um, missions um, uh, wanting to, you know, uh, actually lunar orbiter, uh, wanting to, to look at the, the lunar impact, lunar impact, uh, freshish, uh, close up. So I think yep. it'll be very interesting to compare with your, your, you know, your imaging data. Yeah, the, there's really uh, a lot that's come out of, uh, out, uh, out of these, these measurements. Um, you know, you, you're seeing the coloration of the of the ejecta blanket is, is extremely interesting. You know, it's, sometimes it's bright, sometimes it's dark, and it's all a matter of what material you're you're ex excavating. And then, as I said, um, you know, it it's not only it's not only the impact site itself, but but the apparent disturbances of the of the regolith. A, a good distance away from from the uh, from the impact site, which is not necessarily just um, uh, material that's been thrown there, but it's it's disturbances of the of the top layer. So the the very top layer of the of the lunar surface is thought to be, you know, people use the term fairy castle structure, um, uh, extremely. Uh, low density, very fine, and, and it appears that any kind of disturbance actually tends to flatten it up, and it shows up in the photometry of the observations. And uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's turned out to be a, a, a fascinating topic, uh, more than, well, not just because we were interested in kind of uh, filling the gap in the lunar, uh, in the impact small body impactors, um, where we didn't actually have good measurements. Uh, on the earth, they don't, those, those bodies break up and, and don't hit the surface of the earth. So they break up in the atmosphere and, and uh, uh, you get some information by light curves from, from those impacts, but um, the moon, with with our with with these measurements, we can derive a sort of an energy and a, with an assumed velocity, and um, so it's very complementary to to the uh, Earth measurements. Yes. Um, anyone here uh, want to ask uh, John a question? Um, uh, yes, I actually would very much like to. Yeah, please. Uh, thank you for your talk. I wonder for those in the Hugo's craters which you argued that could be caves or something like that that collapsed over time. Um, I wonder how 
a small satellite mission or a, a lander mission with a small lander would look like for you to best explore that kind of environment? Do you want to land in that crater, hoping that you will actually be able to go somewhere? Or do you want to land on the outside of the crater and move to the edge and then let an, uh, maybe put a rope there and, and, and allow an experiment to slide down? Or, or how, how would that look for you? Like, what, what, what kind of experiment would you like to do there to best explore that? Uh, well, I think uh, you know it's all it's all about what what technology you have available. If if you're doing a robotic uh, exploration uh, without and and I, I assume that would be the first thing you would do, uh, I would envision that you would you would not try to land in it but nearby, and then you would send down probes, uh, maybe with with uh, cables of some sort. Uh, you know, cameras, uh, laser up kind of laser devices to look down deep, and hopefully, you know, you might lower a, a small rover that could really determine how far these, if they are in fact tunnels, how far they go. Measure the temperature, measure the composition. So there's, you know, it'd be a whole host of things. And I, I will say that uh, JAXA, has really focused on on you know ideas for exploring those those uh, uh, lunar pits uh, because as I, as I said they were actually the first to discover them and so they really spent a lot of time thinking about it whether they would be suitable as a lunar base you know where you you could be safe from the radiation environment and uh, uh, perhaps uh, it would be easier to survive the lunar night in, in one of these uh, uh, pets. Yeah, uh, uh, Haruyama-san uh, of JETSA, he, he actually gave a talk, you know, here uh, on the uh, Kaguya result, and he mentioned something on this kind of thing. And so if yeah. you're interested, you could go back, you know, t take a look at his video. OK. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you very much for your nice talk. So. So my uh, my camera, actually, I'm a PI of a lunar impact flash observing camera on board a small CubeSat, Eclius, will be launched by NASA SLS rocket probably this year. So I would like to ask you, how quickly can you check the LRO data to search for a new crater when, when, um, when, if my camera will uh, detect such an uh, event? You're the, you're, 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 Looking for impacts? Uh, impact flood from from Earth, Earth Moon Lagrangian point. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, so our orbit is is fixed. So we we can't obviously we can't move to to a location. Uh, we have to wait till uh, uh, we're over it. Um, so. It, we can do it pretty quickly in, in the sense that uh, it has to be on the day side, uh, but we, we uh, uh, you know, the, the, the orbit is in a fixed plane and, and the moon rotates underneath us. And so uh, it's, it would, in theory, we would be over it in the daytime within a month. So the problem for my, our camera uh, is that the resor special resolution is very low. So probably overall resolution during the mission is about 10 to 30 kilometers mm -hmm. because of small camera. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so can you search for? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. uh, so the the very first impact that we mm. from the Earth flash that we went searching for, we did not see it immediately, but we saw. <laughs> We saw the crater rays. We saw the mm -hmm. we saw rays from the impact, and yeah. mm -hmm. you you could actually see the angle mm -hmm. uh, from one ray to the next angle, and, and 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 then locate. So we knew we knew within the first pass we didn't see it, but mm -hmm. we got enough information to to know where it was, mm -hmm. where to look on the next pass. So okay, that took two months. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Yeah, I, I saw the video. Yes. Oh, okay. So, by the way, I'm now a candidate of uh, of uh, Dear Moon project. 
uh, which will be launched by SpaceX, um, uh, the human, human lunar mission, the civilian lunar mission. So I'm oh, one okay. of the candidate of this project now. So probably oh. I will observe, observe using my camera behind the moon. <laughs> No, oh, wow. Wow. Clear. clear next month. Yeah. Since okay, since okay, could watch the could, could look at the the lunar uh, impact fresh by by his own eyes. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank first you eyewitness uh, lunar impact fresh. <laughs> uh, okay. Good. Uh, any other questions? Uh, <laughs> Actually, I had a question. You mentioned at some moment that you see evidence of ongoing shrinking of the moon's surface. Has that been compared to seismological measurements? The um, the team that uh, uh, were working on this have published a paper where they they have seen uh, completely sure the details, but essentially they have shown that some of these lobate scarps appear to be at a location that is somehow related to the Apollo era measurements of the uh, moonquakes. I'm not completely sure of the details, so, uh, but if you're, uh, you could follow up and, and, and see exactly what, what what they what they observed, but there has been that that study. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, if there's, there are no more questions, um, I will let John go to sleep. No. Okay. <laughs> you, you're you're very very courageous, <laughs> but you look still look very fresh. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you give a talk, you get some adrenaline, and then <laughs> right, and you could talk yeah. forever about LRO. Okay, good. And I, I, I'm sure that I will ask you to come back uh, in a year or so, you know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you so much, John. Yes. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.